Okay, thank you, Kevin. Um, you learn so much each time Kevin gives one of these talks. I, I didn't realize legislation was involving seven touches. I, I can't wait to explore that a little bit more, Kevin. Yeah. In any case, our next speaker, Kevin already mentioned, is Emily Graham. Emily has been with uh, CSRO for many years through Heart Health Strategies, a lobbying group that uh, we use in Washington, D.C. She's going to regale you today with the evolving regulatory and legislative environment, but now at the federal level. So Kevin was talking to you about a lot of state issues. Uh, we're going to take a quick look, uh, an overview, if you will, at the federal level. We're going to focus a little bit on the implementation of the FDA's uh, biosimilar interchangeability guidelines. Now, those came out in, in January, have not yet uh, turned into an act, uh, but we expect that will be passed at some point. Uh, the CSRO has been very active in commenting on the guidelines, and so uh, we've taken an important role. You need to know what's involved, and that's part of what Emily will tell you about. Indeed, she'll also talk about the Part B drug reimbursement issues. I would think you'd want to know about that as well. And finally, something that's near and dear to all of our hearts, MACRA. So without further ado, Emily, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Stevens. I, um, I literally just blew in this morning. <laughs> So um, I have the perfect slide for that. I, uh, I literally feel like Mary Poppins because when people come from Washington, D.C., they usually bring doom and gloom. Um, it's kind of like the IRS, right? <laughs> um, so I try to make the presentation as pleasant and happy and sprinkle a little sugar on these um, somewhat depressing topics. So um, Dr. Stevens mentioned a little bit about uh, biosimilars. Um, I didn't actually formally include that in my presentation, but I will say that um, it's true that there's some guidance documents um, that are underway, and um, my colleague Judith Gorsuch, which some of you know, is working on this um, with uh, some of the other leadership within CSRO, so we are um, heavily engaged in that. Um, the other thing that I did want to say is I really appreciated uh, Kevin's presentation about effective advocacy. Um, all of those principles can be applied at the federal level. Um, CSRO is very engaged at the federal level um, through participating in uh, legislative and advocacy days of the Alliance of Specialty Medicine, as well as the Cognitive Care Alliance and other coalitions that um, Kevin probably mentioned before I blew in. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about macro and rheumatology. I'm going to talk a little bit about what was in the proposed Medicare physician fee schedule for calendar year 2018. I'll talk a little bit about what happened at the MedPAC meeting on Thursday with respect to pharmacy benefit managers and specialty pharmacies. Um, I believe some of my colleagues that are in the room were also there, so we can both talk to you a little bit about that um, when, when this is over. Um, I'm going to also talk to you a little bit about something known as the Red Tape Relief Project. As you know, um, this administration and this Congress has taken um, significant strides to try to reduce regulatory burden and administrative hassle within the Medicare program, so I'll talk a little bit about how CSRO has engaged in that. And then there's just a couple of other regulatory issues that I'm going to touch on. Um, since I only have uh, 30 minutes, um, I want to ask a quick question so I can kind of move things along as quickly as possible. How many of you are familiar with MACRA? Raise your hands high. And how many of you are engaged in MACRA, are already participating at some level in the MACRA program? Okay. All right. So we won't spend too, too much time on that, but... Um, uh, I think all of you, it, it sounds like you are almost all pretty aware of MACRA and what it did. Um, it was uh, enacted into law in April of 2015. Um, the big thing that it did um, that I'm sure everybody in this room is very happy about is it rep repealed the sustainable growth rate formula, which is something that for, I believe it was about 13 years, um, you wore your white coats, you went to Washington, D.C., and you said, stop the bleeding, stop the cuts, we're tired of getting these reductions, and um, every year, year after year after year, your conversion factor was, you know, slated to go down. Um, but it also did something else that was really, really significant, and that is it established this two 
track payment system that is under a framework known as the Quality Payment Program, the QPP. Um, and those two programs are MIPS, the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, and alternative payment models. Um, there are obviously payment adjustments associated with MACRA. Um, there was supposed to be this period of stability to help ease you into these two payment structures. Um, that period of stability hasn't felt so stable because there have been other laws and regulations that have essentially stripped those um, updates away. Um, under the MIPS adjustments, um, we're still under current programs, so there's still uh, some negative adjustments being applied, although in the recent uh, 2018 Medicare Physician Fee Schedule, there were some proposals that may eliminate or uh, significantly reduce those penalties, so CSRO, in conjunction with the Alliance of Specialty Medicine, has um, lent its support and actually asked CMS to go a couple of steps further and do a little bit more to make sure that as few uh, physicians are penalized under those old programs as possible. Um, but in 2019, based on your 2017 performance, so based, basically what you're doing right now, um, you are subject to a minus 4% reduction in your Medicare physician fee uh, schedule reimbursements. Um, you are also eligible for some modest uh, uh, bonus payments. Um, I, I highlight this uh, little 3X here because I want you to understand that even though the law said 4% update, it's not necessarily going to be a 4% update because there's something known as a scaling factor. And for those of you that understand how budget neutrality works, uh, the losers, so people who get cuts, pay the winners. And the way CMS did things for the first year of the program is they tried to make sure that as few people would get cut in the program as possible. So there won't be that many losers to fund the winners. And because of that, um, there's this scaling factor. And the scaling factor is expected to be less than one, which means the bonus payment is going to be likely less than 4%, probably somewhere in the between 2 and 3%. Um, the other thing that I'd like to point out under the MIPS adjustments is there is something extra um, called the Exceptional Performance Adjustment. And um, I believe it's between uh, 2019 and 2024, there is um, every year there will be this $500 million bonus pool of money. So for those of you who exceed an exceptional performance target, so for those of you who, did, who do really, really, really well in the MIPS program, you will not only get your regular MIPS adjustment in the budget neutral side of things, but you would also get an additional bonus that could be up to 10%, which is huge, right? Um, so, that's, so that's that. Um, then, of course, if you were to be in an alternative payment model that exceeds certain targets, then you would get um, a 5% bonus on your physician fee schedule payments. Um, that would end in 2025 unless Congress were to act and, and authorize some additional funding for, for APMs. So participation in year one for rheumatology. Um, so based on CMS's estimates, most rheumatologists are going to be included in the MIPS program, um, but a lot of people won't be, but rheumatologists in particular because of the conditions and the diseases that you're treating and your population, um, you're going to be uh, likely to be included in the program. Um, just real quick, I'm gonna give you a snapshot of what's required for full participation in the program. Um, under the quality category, um, which replaced what you might know as the PQRS program, the Physician Quality Reporting System, this is kind of what replaced that. Um, this is worth 60% of your score under MIPS. Um, you would have to report on six quality measures. One of those measures has to be an outcome measure, and if an outcome measure isn't available, then you would need to report on a high priority measure. Um, within the rheumatology measure set, you are in a good place because you do have enough measures. Um, you can report them through a registry or a QCDR. That's the most optimal way to probably participate in this program because of the measures that you have. ACR has a registry. They have the RISE registry, and they have other registries, I believe, that you can use, but that's probably the, the one that you would be uh, best suited for. Um, you can also get bonus points when you, uh, part or when you report on additional high priority measures. Um, for this year and potentially next year, depending on how things go in the uh, proposed QPP requirements, 
um, you could, uh, or there's a three-point floor for all measures. So regardless of whether or not the measure has all of the, um, has benchmarks, whether you meet certain uh, 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 reporting thresholds, um, you would get three points for every submitted measure. Um, in CMS, you, you can report on more than six measures, and a lot of people actually will report on more than six measures, especially if they're in a QCDR, uh, which is a qualified clinical data registry, if you're reporting through a registry to get all of your information to CMS. Um, if you report it on more than six measures, CMS is only gonna count the ones that you do the best on, so that's great. Um, with respect to improvement activities, um, this is worth 15% of your score. This is the brand new category. This is something that you haven't heard of before, or you've heard of it through MACRA, but it's not uh, coming or stemming from a prior program. Um, improvement activities, I like to call it the kitchen sink, um, because what it was supposed to do is capture all of the things that you're doing uh, from a quality improvement perspective that were never captured in other quality improvement programs. Uh, so things that are relevant to you are when you use the FRAX tool, when you do the rapid three, four, or five. Those types of things are actually counted, um, and we know this for sure because we checked with CMS to make sure, um, are counted as improvement activities. But what you have to do is you have to report on four or potentially two. It depends on the size of your practice. Um, and the different uh, improvement activities are weighted. They're either high or they're medium. I believe FRAX and uh, RAPID 345, those are um, individual, you can report on uh, both of those actually, but they're both weighted at medium. And if you're in a small practice, which is 15 or fewer physicians, um, you can report on both of those things and you can get the full credit for the um, improvement activity score. Um, there's a lot of other things that you can do too. I don't believe I have the slides in here on it because I knew we wouldn't have a lot of time. but. The other thing too is if you're in a group practice and you're reporting as a group, as long as one person in the practice is doing that activity for this year and this year alone, at least right now, um, the entire group gets credit for that one person's um, engagement. Okay, so the next category is advancing care information. This replaced the EHR incentive program for uh, Medicare eligible professionals. This is the most complicated category of all the categories. I almost feel like it's a video game because you can get a base score and then you get performance points and then there's an opportunity for bonus points. It's very complicated, but at the end of the day, there is a required set of measures that you have to report on depending on whether you're using certified EHR technology at, that is uh, 2015 edition cert or 2014 edition cert, then the next step would be, depending on um, whether you are working really hard to close the gap on certain objectives and measures, and what I mean by that is you're reporting a numerator and denominator information, and so um, let's say you have uh, 100 patients and you reported on 80. Um, if you reported on even more than that and you reported on 90 or let's say you report on 100, the closer you get to closing the gap between your numerator and denominator, you're getting performance points for that. Many of you will remember under the old EHR incentive program, you had to meet certain thresholds. So for maybe a measure you had to report on 50% of your patients or 60% of your patients. That's not how it works under the new um, ACI category you're getting your performance points based on whether or not you're you know, closing the gap, if you will, between the numerator and denominator. And then, of course, you can get bonus points. And bonus points, um, you, can, you can actually get bonus points for reporting to the QCDR. And then last but not least is cost. Cost is extremely important, even though in this year it is weighted at 0%. Um, you don't have to do anything in the sense that you don't have to proactively submit information. Cost is calculated based on administrative claims data. Um, again, it's weighted at 0% for purposes of 2017 and your 2019 payment adjustment. CMS is proposing the same thing for purposes of uh, 2018 performance in the 2020 payment adjustment year. Um, right now, statutorily, they are required to make that jump up significantly in the next performance year and the, and, and the uh, subsequent uh, 
payment adjustment year, um, and we're obviously very concerned about that. There are some episode-based payment measures that are in the works for your specialty, and CSRO has provided the agency with some comments through some uh, open public comment periods about those. Um, I will say that we are, we would rather see you measured under those measures than the current measures, um, because those measures that are available now are meaningless to you. Um, the, the current measures that you had been measured under the value-based payment modifier program, which is what the cost category is replacing essentially, um, those have been extremely frustrating for a number of you. You've been attributed patients that you maybe saw only one time and you're like, well, I, how could I possibly have managed this patient and be attributed this patient? I saw them one time. So that's, that's been a concern. Uh, transition policies for year one. Um, CMS instituted something that I'm sure you've heard this term before, pick your pace. Um, so there's, there's more than four options if you really wanted to think about it, but um, the worst thing you could do would be do nothing. If you don't participate at all and you do nothing, you're guaranteed to get a 4% cut, and I don't think any of you wanna do that. If you are not comfortable moving forward in this program, you don't have the resources yet, the very bare minimum in order to avoid a negative adjustment would be to submit one quality data code for one patient, and that's going to get you to the performance threshold, whoops, which is three points, and you would get a zero adjustment. You would get a you know, three-point score and a zero adjustment. I would probably encourage you to do more than that. And I say that because this is a great year for you to really uh, test the system beyond that, try to see what your practice is capable of, and, um, and engage while you have an opportunity. Uh, it, it's not really a free ride by any, any stretch, and it's obviously a significant burden on all of your practices to engage in this program but the thresholds and the reporting requirements are definitely going to increase at some point in the future. Um, MACRO is a bipartisan initiative. We don't envision that it's gonna completely go away. Do we think that some of the hassles will be trimmed down now that uh, Secretary Price is at the helm of HHS? Yes, we do envision that, and there, there's a lot of that reflected in the 2018 QPP uh, proposed requirements. However, um, this is a good opportunity for you to see you know, what you can do and to try to get your clinical workflows going in, in the direction of quality reporting. Um, what would probably be optimal would be to at least submit for 90 days, um, and that would be full participation in the program. That's the slide from before where I gave you, you know, this is what the requirements are. Um, if you're gonna do it for 90 days, why not do it longer? Just keep going. Um, you might be able to exceed that, uh, exceptional performance threshold, which has been set at 70 points, and then you might have access to that um, additional bonus money that I talked about earlier. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you something really horrible right now, but we think it's gonna go away. We feel pretty good about it going away, but um, things change. So uh, last year um, in the 2017 QPP regs, somebody asked the question, does the MIPS adjustment apply to Part B drugs? Because in all the prior programs, PQRS, EHR, value modifier, the adjustment that you took only applied to your covered professional services. Makes sense, right? You do have some control over that. Um, CMS said, oh, we don't know. We'll get back to you on that at a later date. Now we're in this year. Nobody ever really got back to anyone. And in this year's 2018 proposed rule, CMS said, we just wanna clarify that actually it applies to your drugs. That, for some, came as a massive shock. How could CMS apply the MIPS adjustment to drugs? It's not just the downward adjustment, it's the upward adjustment. Do you understand me? <laughs> That is significant. Um, I think it was really significant too because this is um, a time when we're talking about escalating drug prices and the administration is literally going to incentivize you for, the more, for, for you know, using more drugs. So it was definitely shocking. 
Um, we are working, as are many, many, many organizations, to say this is not a good idea. Um, the downward adjustment alone, in, in conjunction with sequestration, would close down a lot of practices. A lot of rheumatology practices are small. Um, this cut could be devastating and close doors and hinder access uh, for beneficiaries um, at a very significant and grave level. And then, of course, you know, the bump maybe isn't the most appropriate thing. So we are working on a solution. We believe that the secretary actually has some uh, statutory authority here to um, interpret the law in a different way that would allow him to um, change, change this. Um, of course, it would be cleaner if the law were written differently. So we're also working uh, with the Congress on uh, technical correction, yes. So if we can get um, either one of those taken care of, it would it would go back and and it would never happen. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so the question was, if we were to get this issue fixed, when would it take effect? Um, we believe it would never take effect. <laughs> it wouldn't happen. So that's what our goal is: is to make sure that this that this uh, adjustment on Part B drugs does not happen. Oh, 2019, I'm sorry, based on your 2017 performance. Yes, yes. So the question was, if this were to happen, when would it take effect? And um, it would take effect uh, in, tw uh, in your 2019 payment adjustment, which is based on your 2017 performance. My apologies. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, MIPS year two uh, proposals. Um, so CMS is proposing um, in a recent regulation that came out over the, uh, over the late spring, early summer, that more clinicians would be exempt from the QPP program because they're proposing to increase the low volume threshold. 63% um, of all Medicare clinicians would be exempt from MIPS in 2018. That's huge. It's like, who's left? <laughs> um, Pick your pace, or at least some aspects of pick your pace would continue, um, because in many instances that three-point floor would continue into uh, into the next year. Um, CMS also um, proposes to increase the performance threshold um, from three to fifteen. So, do you remember how in the beginning I said if you report, you know, one quality measure for one patient, you'd get three points and you'd get a null adjustment. Um, that could potentially go away. Um, you would have to do a little bit more in 2018. Um, we don't know. You know, we would obviously like to see the threshold be lower than that, but but we'll see. Uh, cost uh, continue to be held at zero percent, um, as that's what's being proposed. Um, in big news, this was huge. Is that CMS is proposing to allow. Um, uh, clinicians to use 2014 edition CERT um, in lieu of 2015 edition CERT. 2015 edition CERT would be optional, which is fantastic. That was a big win, I, I would think. Um, and then even maybe bigger than that is if you're in a small practice, you might be able to be exempt altogether from the ACI performance category. That's a big win. Um, the other thing is if you were to report in the ACI category, um, you would only have to uh, report for 90 days. Um, there's something called virtual groups that's being offered, um, and that is new. Um, the jury is still out on uh, whether or not, I mean, it's, it's probably a great idea, but I think it's operationally, administratively challenging right now. Um, but if we can get this to work, it might be a good thing. Um, another thing that CMS is proposing um, that could potentially be a challenge. It, um, it, ha it sounds good on, 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 on its face, but it might actually be more problematic um, than, than we originally would have thought. But reporting could be accomplished through multiple different mechanisms within one performance category. So under the, cur under the current rules, um, for example, under quality, um, you can only report using one mechanism. So you could only use claims, you could only use a QCDR, you wouldn't be able to report through multiple different mechanisms in one performance category. Um, under the proposal, you could do that. And the reason why that could be a challenge is for a multitude of reasons. Um, one, it would be administratively burdensome. 
Two, let's say you didn't have enough measures. Well, now, because you can report through multiple options, CMS might say, well, if you reported through this mechanism, you could reach that. And so where you might have been able to um, get some flexibility, now you wouldn't because you would be forced to do multiple options. Um, so the impact on the rheumatology measure set, um, there's the addition of a whole host of measures and the removal of uh, one measure. Um, we're not big fans of this change, so we've asked CMS to maintain our measure set as it currently stands. Um, and then the impact on rheumatology, again, um, the majority of rheumatologists are expected to continue to have to participate in, or in uh, the MIPS program. Um, in our comments um, from CSRO and many of the state organizations signed on, we really appreciate that. Um, we hope you will continue to sign on to our uh, comment letters. Uh, we oppose inclusion of the Part B drugs in the MIPS payment adjustment, and we gave uh, rationale for why the secretary had authority to do that. Maintain the rheumatology measure set, uh, maintain the 0% uh, cost weight in 2018, and then we also said, again, you know, we don't have appropriate episode-based measures, so until you do, you should continue to weight us at zero. Um, we had submitted FRACs as a standalone um, improvement activity, or we said, you know, if you can't make it a standalone, you need to move it from the current improvement activity that it's uh, housed in. Um, and we did get confirmation that they did propose to move it into a better improvement activity category, but we asked them to at least spell that out. And then we also supported the Alliance of Specialty Medicine comments, which went into all of those other issues. Um, if you want a copy of those, um, I can ask Kevin to send those around or potentially post them on the uh, CSRO website. Uh, just quickly on uh, MedPAC, um, I'm not going to get into all the details, but MedPAC um, takes some issue with the way CMS has implemented the MACRA program. They would really like to see physicians moving into alternative payment models. They're worried that MIPS continues to create um, incentives for providers to stay in, in the fee-for-service model. And so they are looking to try to do some rebalancing here. And um, they have a multitude of different ways that they think that they can accomplish that. Of course, the secretary has not taken up any of this and Congress hasn't taken up any of these recommendations, but um, MedPAC is hot on the case. We all know that MACRA is not perfect, and so through the Alliance of Specialty Medicine, and of course the American Medical Association is also looking at this as well, um, there are a number of different uh, legislative reforms that uh, could be taken up, um, including uh, the extension of transition policies. Right now, CMS only has so long that they're allowed to um, use transition policies. We think that physicians need a lot longer time. Um, provide some additional flexibility in terms of how physicians are assessed. Increasing the availability of uh, virtual groups once they do get off the ground. Um, statutorily delaying the requirements for uh, 2015 edition CERT. And then, um, of course, the Part B drug issue, applying MIPS adjustments to covered professional services only. And then there's some other changes. Um, most of those have to do with um, alternative payment models. So the fee schedule, um, and I know I have to hurry because we, um, I think our next speaker might be here very soon. Um, the 2018 physician fee schedule had a couple of uh, positive nuggets. It had a, a number of negative nuggets. Um, how many of you are using ultrasound in your practice? Ultrasound, okay, a decent number of you are using it. Um, I'd say that's probably the biggest concern that we raise in our comments is uh, some practice expense reductions uh, to the ultrasound codes um, of the extremities. Um, this is a significant concern for us. Um, we also have some concerns about the new modifiers that uh, CMS put in place that um, are required for use if you are moving from antiquated imaging systems to digital radiography. Um, we would like to see CMS hold you harmless from any financial and criminal repercussions because we don't believe the agency has done a very good job of educating you on how to use those modifiers and we're very concerned that, they, that you may be subject to rack audits and that this is gonna be a target. So we are um, asking for uh, the agency to, to um, hold you harmless for um, a, a certain period. 
Another big issue is um, with respect to uh, biosimilars and uh, J codes. Right now, I think all of you know that um, CMS had um, already said that with respect to biosimilars, there's going to be just one J code. Um, we don't think that makes a lot of sense and it hinders innovation, and so we're saying that that's not a good idea. And then with respect to some of the other provisions, um, I mentioned earlier in the presentation that uh, CMS was um, proposing to eliminate some of the uh, penalties with respect to prior quality reporting programs in 2018. That was included in the fee schedule. We talk about that as CSRO as part of our Alliance of Specialty Medicine comments. Um, another really important issue that many of you are probably aware of is that CMS um, is accepting comments right now on how to reduce the administrative burden associated with documenting for evaluation and management services. And I'm sure that puts a smile on many of your faces. <laughs> um, so CMS, um, uh, this is definitely uh, prompted by Secretary Price, as you can imagine, because he's a, a, a physician himself. Um, we have submitted comments about that issue, not only through the Alliance of Specialty Medicine, but also in our role as part of the Cognitive Care Alliance. All right, so MedPAC and PBMs. You're going to hear, obviously, about PBMs all day today, but I'm just going to tell you a little bit about MedPAC's role. Um, MedPAC took this issue up last year, um, mostly in response to concerns about high drug prices and the impact on, um, on the Medicare program and beneficiaries. Um, because that's their focus, is, uh, is being good steward of the Medicare program, so they have some significant concerns. Um, last year, they talked about it in the context of the entire uh, drug supply chain, and now they're looking at every different um, uh, component of the drug supply chain. So they started with PBMs and specialty pharmacies. Um, they are worried that uh, specialty drugs are going to increase. They recognize that there's complex transitions and incentives in the supply chain. Uh, some potential policy questions that they raised are what, uh, what would it mean to have exclusive pharmacy, specialty pharmacy networks? Um, what what uh, should they do about data transparency? And what would it look like if the uh, Medicare Advantage plans were to manage uh, specialty drugs under the medical benefit, so moving some of those Part D drugs into Part B, if you will. Um, commissioner discussion, wow. Um, clearly, they were very confused, and uh, it was compli a complicated issue for them. Significant entanglement of financial interest. They could not discern you know, what kind of impact it would have on beneficiaries and how, um, whether or not there was any pass-through of the rebates, uh, clearly not, maybe in the commercial plans, but not with Medicare. Um, the plan, or the PBMs were saying, look, the plans are in control of the benefit, not us. The plans were saying, we don't really know what goes on, but we do tell them, do a good job on our behalf. It was clear that the person from a PBM um, knew the most about what's going on. Um, data transparency. Um, it was clear that um, people are unclear about data transparency. Um, there was a specific interest in rheumatoid arthritis drugs, um, and there was no mention of some of the issues that you're most concerned about, non-medical switching, the impact on quality and access to medicines. Um, I think I'm out of time now, so Kevin, I don't know if you want me to continue on or... Okay, awesome. Um, red Tape Relief Project. So uh, Congressman T. Berry of Ohio initiated something known as the Red Tape Relief Project, where he is soliciting ideas from the public about how the Congress can help reduce the administrative burden for those of you that are uh, seeing Medicare beneficiaries. And there's three stages of this program, requesting the feedback. Then they will host roundtables, and then they will take action on the issues. Um, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So they're going to take up the issues that have the most um, the, the most uh, uh, feedback from stakeholders or the, the, the most you know, input. And so CSRO coordinated its response with the Alliance of Specialty Medicine on a number of different issues, but of course individually our biggest issue was the MIPS adjustment in Part B drugs under, um, under the macro programs. Um, some other regulatory issues uh, quickly that I'll touch on. Many of you may have seen that uh, something pretty significant happened within CMS and the Innovation Center, and that is Secretary Price 
um, made uh, good, as good as he could, I guess, on his uh, statements during um, his confirmation hearings that he did not like mandatory payment models. And so um, there were some significant changes made to the comprehensive care for joint replacement model, and he canceled the EPM and CR models. Um, there, uh, I guess basically the reason why this matters to you at some level is because this kind of gives us a little bit of foresight into the direction of CMMI, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. That's the place where um, organizations go and take their good ideas on how to reform uh, delivery and payment um, within healthcare. Some of those ideas are very specific to a specialty, some of them are very broad, but um, that's, that's where uh, those good ideas go. Maybe they die, maybe they don't. Um, also, um, we are waiting for the 2019 Notice of Benefit and Payment Parameters to come out. Um, this is where we generally see issues of network adequacy within the exchange programs addressed, as well as a number of other issues like risk adjustment. Um, so we'll be keeping our eyes out to see, you know, how that will impact rheumatology. Um, some big changes to program integrity um, within CMS. Um, there's something new that was um, addressed in one MAC, I believe it was Neridian, um, and it's expanding. Um, it's called Targeted Probe and Educate, TPE. Um, and this is really exciting. So for those of you that are familiar with original Medicare review, um, you probably were, um, if you ever went under review, you noticed that um, you would be inundated with um, an enormous number of uh, medical documentation requests. Um, you might be on review forever and ever on end. Um, under this new system, Targeted Probe and Educate, um, there will be limitations on how many medical records they can take from you and they will also um, work with you through an educational program to help you improve so that way you are not um, subject to, uh, uh, to um, additional audits and um, additional problems with other types of uh, uh, auditors like RACs. Um, under the RAC program, um, they're instituting this new 30-day waiting period before sending claims for adjustment. So if a RAC says that there's a problem, um, in certain instances, you might be able to appeal that claim or you might be able to um, resubmit that claim, which is great that that wasn't happening before. And the ZPICs, all the Zone Program Integrity Contractors, which if you heard from a ZPIC, that was very scary. Um, the ZPICs are going away. They're being uh, subsumed into the UPIC program. And last but not least, um, the FDA, um, in order to comply with some recent executive orders that, uh, well, I guess they're not so recent anymore, but relatively recent executive orders to reduce regulatory burden um, and reduce regulation in particular. Uh, they issued some uh, documents that give us 90 days to tell the agency what regulations need to be pulled back. Um, so we'll probably be responding to that about a number of different issues that rheumatology has with what's going on in FDA. So if, I don't know if there's any time at all for questions, but I'm happy to do my best Um, so there were some recommendations that were made, so um, just in case people didn't hear, um, I was asked about the MedPAC recommendations on Part B reimbursement. Um, there were some recommendations that were made last year. I believe they were included in the June report, but I can't remember, I can't quite remember. Um, but they are obviously, you know, wanting to see uh, a number of different things go on with respect to to drug reimbursement, they're, you know, trying to what they believe is protect the program from escalating costs. Um, I'm more than happy to get some additional information to you, but I didn't come prepared to talk about that today. Yes, sir. So I was asked if sequestration is an indefinite program that goes on forever. I believe it is until Congress takes action to do otherwise. Any other questions in the room? All right, well, I thank you for your time, and I hope you have a great rest of your conference as I blow back to Washington. Thank you.